feast, O Yahweh. We, your people, give you praise. O great King, look down upon us with your tender mercy. For it is our wish to do thy will. Let our hearts and minds be fixed on worshiping you, for indeed you are worthy. Just as our fathers found favor in your sight, let us pray. Find the same, find the same as we know that you change not. Forgive us of our many sins against you and your laws, as we seek our redemption in your Son, Yeshua. As we light the candles for this gathering, let it be in memory of the light of the world, who has given us hope in this life that you have blessed us with. And now all of us, your male and female servants, lift up your mighty name and say, Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be Yahweh, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commands, redeemed us by the blood of his Son, Yahshua, and gave us command to hear and respond to the call of the shofar. stand up here and, and to share Yahweh's word with everyone and I appreciate everybody coming. Um, my mother says to tell everybody that she loves them and she wishes she could be here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to begin by reading a couple sets of opening verses out of the Torah. Numbers chapter 29 verses 35 through 40. And on the eighth day, you have an assembly. You do no servile work. And you shall bring near a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, sweet fragrance unto Yahweh. One bull, one ram, seven lambs, a year old, a perfect one. Their grain offering and their drink offering for the bull, for the ram, and for the lambs by their number according to the right ruling. And one goat is a sin offering besides the continual burnt offering, its offering, and its drink offering. These you prepare to Yahweh at your appointed times, besides your vowed offerings and your voluntary offerings, as your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, as your drink offerings and your peace offerings. And Moshe spoke to all the children of Israel, according to all that Yahweh had commanded Moshe. And I believe if we look very close at these scriptures, we see at the end that the man of Yahweh spoke nothing other than what Yahweh told him to speak to the children. And that's another sign of, of us conveying Torah to our children. Also, you'll notice that this has something to do with the eighth day showing us that all of the right rulings and the judgments will be present in the thousand-year millennial reign for the upcoming great, very last day. And what, that's what the PowerPoint is going to be about this evening as well. One more set of verses in 1 Kings, chapter 8. Verses 54 through 61. And it came to be when Shalman had ended praying all this prayer. Now most of you, that, those of you that were here last night, you understand what happened at that. The dedication of the temple is what it's talking about here. And the presence of Yahweh showed up so mightily in this sukkah, this more permanent sukkah, this temple that uh, Solomon and the children of Israel had prepared that nobody was able to enter this temple. It's also a sign of how when we move all of the commandments that were in the Ark of the Covenant and all of the utensils, we're going over that word last night, utensil can mean vessel, and we are his vessels. So when we put the commandments 
and the tent of meeting and all the utensils were moved into the new temple. It's a sign of, once again, Yahshua is that tent that we all dwell in. The ram's skins dyed red that covered the tent of meeting was a symbol of what was going to happen in Yahshua. All of the utensils that had been ordained by the Father or cleansed in the tent, Yahshua's body, moving into the permanent temple. So it's showing us something of, of latter events that will take place. And I believe it's a huge sign of everything that will take place in the thousand year millennial reign. In the verses we just read in Numbers, you'll notice that all the principles and judgments were still present during the thousand year millennial reign. Very, very critical for us to understand that those, those judgments and commandments were not nailed to the stake. When Yahshua returns, he's re-implementing them into the kingdom reign. Very critical for us to understand that. <clears throat> okay, uh, all this prayer and supplication unto Yahweh that he rose up from before the altar of Yahweh from kneeling on his knees. Now this is a symbol of the king of Israel, shadow of Yahshua, coming up from the altar. Has he not presented his blood at the altar? See, all of these things are, uh, are something that would take place uh, with Yahshua and his sacrifice. Uh, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to the heavens. <clears throat> now, those of you that weren't here last night, we went over the ancient hieroglyphics of Solomon's name. It has the same family roots as the ancient Hebrew letters for Shalom. His name was actually Shalomen, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. Shalom would be the, the more proper English transliteration of that. Um, in his name, though, they take out the law. And they add the hay, a little man raising his hands at the end. And it was showing us that during a time of peace, because we know Solomon messed up. But during a time of peace when he was king in Israel, that he would raise his hands to the Father. And what does it say here? He was kneeling on his knees and with his hands spread up. See, in the ancient hieroglyphics, if you look at the, the pictures, they actually tell you something that would happen in that man's life during a time of peace. And he spread his hands up to the heavens, verse 55, and he stood and blessed the assembly of Israel with a voice saying, Blessed be Yahweh who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he has promised. Do we not enter this rest when Yahshua comes back? See, it's all a huge prelude to what's going to happen when Yahshua returns. It's all written. I mean, the good news is in almost every letter of the ancient hieroglyphics. And when, once you can come to that understanding, you look at this, you see the good news from cover to cover, rather than just in the Brit Hadashah or New Testament. <clears throat> there has not felt one word of all his good words which he promised to his servant Moshe. Yahweh our Elohim is with us as he was with our fathers. He does not leave us nor forsake us. Now remember that's a quote also in the Great High Shah. To incline our hearts to himself. It's always been a thing of the heart. It's not a New Testament teaching. It's always been a matter of cleansing man's sinful heart that was uh, warped in iniquity toward Yahweh's commandments to cleanse the heart first before you can actually be present and dedicate your temple to the Father. Everybody has the same opportunity. As a matter of fact, if you go to Galatians chapter 3, it says that the good news was preached first by Elohim to Abraham. It's got to be the same good news. Verse 57, Yahweh our Elohim is with us as he, once again I'm going to go back over that, Yahweh our Elohim is with us as he was with our fathers. Notice that that's going to be something that takes place also in the thousand year millennial reign. Just as he was with our fathers when they came out of Egypt, as we come out of the world and we enter into the thousand year millennial reign, he's going to be there with us as well. He does not leave us nor forsake us. Verse 58, to incline our hearts, see once again we see that it's, it's all got to do with the heart. To incline our hearts to himself, to walk in his ways, and to guard his commands, and his laws, and his right rulings, which he commanded our fathers. 
And that these words of mine, with which I have made supplication before Yahweh, be near Yahweh our Elohim, day and night, to maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people, Yisrael. The matter of each day in its day. So these, these judgments are supposed to be part of our lives each and every day, not just on Shabbat. It's every day. Verse 60, so that all the people of the earth might know that Yahweh is Elohim, there is no one else. See, when people look upon us and they see us celebrating these feasts, and they see us happy and joyous and we're feasting and having a good time, um, they look upon us and say, you know, what is that? What is that glow that I see in those people? They have, they're, they're looking forward to Saturday. They're, they're always doing something that makes them different. But they're always happy. And if you notice, we'll get that a lot as believers in Yahshua. You know, people will go, they're so different, but man, they're happy. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> go figure. <clears throat> Verse 61, let your heart therefore be perfect to Yahweh. Once again, showing us that all of these judgments, commandments, and everything that has to do with the feasts and the temple being prepared, which is what was happening here, it was being dedicated, has to do with something about our heart. Let your heart, therefore, be perfect to Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his laws and guard his commands as at this day. Hallelujah. So, there's a few things out of those readings. <clears throat> that I've prepared a, a PowerPoint teaching on, and I hope that you guys enjoy it. <clears throat> We're going to be taking a very deep look at this word gathering, because it comes up a lot in all of these readings about the feasts. And whenever you see an English word come up so much, it really pays us to, to set down and to dig into these words and look at the ancient hieroglyphics and see what the letters pointed to. Because there's a, there's a very deep meaning to that specific word in Yahweh's eyes. So that's just a, it's just, we got together. You know, it's, we gathered together that day. I've seen a bunch of kids gathered over there. I've seen, but in the Hebrew, this word takes on a very, very deep meaning. <clears throat> okay, so here we see, <clears throat> in Leviticus 23, 35 to 36, on the first day is a set apart gathering. Here's, here's that word once. You do no so by a word. For seven days you bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day, which is where we're at today, there shall be a set-apart gathering. For notice, this is a Kodesh gathering. It's not, just, it's not just a gathering together, but it's Kodesh for you. And you shall bring an offering made by fire to Yahweh. The reason why this word Kodesh or set-apart is there is because Yahweh is keeping us Kodesh. By following this secular cycle in the feasts. He's covering us. He's protecting us. Just like the children of Israel were when they were roaming around out in the desert for 40 years when they met in the tent of meeting. It is a closing festival. That's another thing that we need to pay attention to. It's a closing festival. And I believe that what Yahweh is showing us here is what's going to happen at the end of the thousand year millennial reign is going to be the closing festival. It's all over with. The last, last great day is going to be a new beginning for an eternal reign for Yahweh and his people here on this earth. There'll be no other governments. There'll be no other laws. There'll be no other word being spoken except for what was being spoken in the Garden of Eden, for instance. His word will reign in his kingdom, in his alone. You do no servile work. So this proposes the question, what does Yahweh mean by this is a set-apart gathering and a closing festival? Believe it or not, the New Testament of Brit Hadashah shows us many, many answers to that one question. And we're going to touch on a few of those tonight. <clears throat> I, once again, I believe all of this is linked to the thousand year millennial reign, and we're going to be going over some verses to kind of sh uh, show you why I believe that and why, why I'm not alone in, the, in, the, in that belief. Um, we need to prove it with scripture though. It's, a, it's, it's nice to have a, your own picture of something, but if you can't prove it by scripture, you need to back up and punt. 
because many times we'll take specific, certain, just one verse out of a chapter and try to make a make what we think become true to, to ourselves and then try to convince other people of it. But that's pulling things out of context. But if we use scripture, not just part of a scripture or one scripture, but a bunch of different uh, scriptures in both the Torah and the Brit Shah, then it becomes confirmation. Then it becomes true. Because you'll see that the prophets and apostles both taught the same exact thing. So in Revelations chapter 20, verses 12 through 15, we see, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened. So here's some possibilities. Some of these people had not received Torah. That's one of the books. The other one is the book of remembrance that we read about in, read about in Malachi. Then we know for sure that there is a Lamb's book of life, and I submit to you that could possibly be the same book of remembrance that is spoken of in Malachi. Because those who are remembered are those who believe and confess in Yahshua and have accepted, of course, Yahweh's rules for his kingdom. That's what brings people into remembrance with him, is when he sees the law written on your heart. He remembers those people. Uh, and then we have the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books according to their what? Works. Now let's look at a doctrine that we've received in churchanity here. And they say that it doesn't matter about our works. This is approximately... Don't throw rocks at me if I've got a few years off here. But this would be, let's see, Yahshua was, was crucified somewhere between 30 and 33 of the Common Era. And this book was written somewhere between 95 and 100 of the Common Era. So, some 60 years later, this emissary or apostle of the Messiah said that all of the dead would be judged according to their works. <coughs> that contradicts a lot of theology that we received while we were uh, in my humble opinion being deceived by certain doctrines in the church. Um, once again, the people in the church need they, 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 they need we need to pray for them. We need to pray that Yahweh will show them um, because just because we have received the truth doesn't mean that we're, we're better than anyone. We have been fall, we have fallen under his favor now. And it's and it's a huge blessing to be able to repent. That's one of Yahweh's biggest blessings was the gift of repentance. So we need to pray for those people. Okay, so here we see that they were judged according to the words, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and the grave gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Now remember. This, of course, is during and right before the last great day in the thousand-year millennial reign. That's what we're going to see. Okay, then we have Revelation 20, verse 14 through 15. And the dead and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. Now remember that. Because as we go to research some of these Hebrew words in the ancient hieroglyphics, this is what he's saving us from. Fire, hot, burning. See, this will consume death, hell, Hades, whatever you want to refer to it, Gehenna, you know. And it's also going to consume Hasatan, the adversary. And when he joins his two buddies, the false prophet, and <laughs> in the lake of fire, uh, and the beast. So, the last day for anything or anyone in opposition to Yahweh is what this is speaking about. Once everything that is in opposition to Yahweh is cast into the lake of fire, there's going to be a new beginning. That's what happens after the last, last great day in the thousand year millennial reign. There's going to be a total new beginning for Yahweh's reign here on this earth because he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful here and multiply here. And that plan will come to pass. <laughs> Here, we 
we are going to be fruitful and we multiply, we will multiply just as he said in the beginning. The original plan will stay intact and it will be followed through because Yahweh is a man of his word. Hallelujah. However, it will be a new beginning for all of those found in the book of life as we see in the following verses. Um, I'll go ahead and read those real quick. Revelation <coughs> chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. What I want to do is kind of set everything in order before we go into the study of the words because we're going to see some, some very huge revelations here. So 21 verses 1 through 8, it says, And I saw a renewed heaven and a renewed earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea is no more. Remember, it just says that the sea was going to give up all of the dead. Many times the word sea can mean groups of people as well. Verse 2, And I, Yohanan, saw the set-apart city, the renewed Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, See, the booth, there's the, there's the sukkah. There's the sukkah. That's, that's why we build su uh, sukkahs during this time. is because that's what we're trying to do is move into the permanent sukkah that Yahweh has prepared in the Shemaim. And all of this will be brought to pass by everybody that is coming to Yahshua in the thousand year millennial reign. And I heard a voice from heaven crying, See, the booth of Elohim is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. Just as it was in the Garden of Eden. He's walking with Adam in the cool of the day. We'll walk with him again here during the cool of the day. Verse 4. And Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, and there shall be no more pain, for the former matters have passed away. See, anything in opposition to Yahweh... Death, pain, anything, all of that stuff is going to be consumed in the lake of fire, and therefore we will have a new beginning. Verse 5, and he who is sitting on the throne said, see, I make all matters new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and trustworthy. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Aleph and the Tal, the beginning and the end. To the one who thirsts, I shall give of the fountain of water of life without payment. And the one who overcomes shall inherit all of this, and I shall be his Elohim, and he shall be my son. Now here's who's excluded. These are the ones that are going to the lake of fire. But as for the cowardly, the untrustworthy, and the abominable, all of the abominations that are listed in the Torah are still an abomination when this takes place. And murderers and those who whore and drug sorcerers and idolaters and all the false, their part is in the lake which burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Okay. So before we get into the rest of the PowerPoint, let me... Let me, let me kind of expound on what he's saying here. The word says that it is appointed to every man who is born after the genealogy of Adam, it is appointed to every man to die once, correct? So, who was Yahshua's father? It wasn't Joseph. Right? It was Yahweh. Some of the brothers called him Yahuwah. So he was not bound by that law in the Torah that he must die once because he didn't sin. And he didn't come from the seed of man. He came from the seed that was given to the woman directly from Yahweh. So he cheated that first death. You understand what I'm saying? He didn't have to die that first death because he didn't come from the seed of a man. So the death that he died was the death that we were to die. He died the second death for us. 
He died the second death. And the word tells us that he went in there and he snatched the keys of death, hell, and Hades. That's why we can no longer be held by death if we are indeed in the Messiah. Because he already died that death we were supposed to die. Hallelujah. That's hallelujah. Now, having laid that foundation, let's continue on here. We're going to be looking at this, this word gathering in the Hebrew. Now, there should be, I don't know if there's any left, but there's some of these floating around out there with the Hebrew characters on it once again. There's a few more over here on the desk. You guys don't have one. Um, but it comes from the Strong's Hebrew number 4744, and it's Mihra, Mihra in Hebrew. It's in the ancient Hebrew lexicon, which shows us all of the first forms of Hebrew characters. We see that it's made up of the mem, the, I believe mean, that's a kuf, is it? Yeah. Oh, on your, on your paper that you're looking at, see this sign right here? <coughs> it's actually in the, uh, uh, a ladder sign. It's the one, two, three, four. It's the fifth one from the bottom. It's, it's the circle, but it's, it's upright on a stick rather than on a horizontal stick. But it is, it is the letter Kuf. So we see that it, um, Mikra is made of, of the letter Mim, Kuf, Resh, and Hey. Now here's the literal concrete definition out of the ancient biblical Hebrew lexicon. A what? A cool place to escape. What are we escaping? <laughs> oh boy. We're escaping the lake of fire. You see how much more you can gather out of just looking at the ancient Hebrew letters here. This word, mikra, which means gathering. When we are gathering here, brothers and sisters and your children, that means that he is protecting us and he's going to keep us from going into that fire. That's what the gathering is for. So how much more urgent should it not be for us to share these truths with our loved ones. Because this is a form of protection when we gather during these feasts. There's the literal definition, cool of mikra. And that is the purpose of gathering. That is the concrete word in definition in ancient hieroglyphics. A cool place to escape. Yahshua, during the thousand year millennial reign, is providing a place of escape for all of those who are in his body. Now, this is how this Hebrew language works. I don't know if any of you studied this, but let me, let me show you. We have, um, this, these are family cognates. Once again, the Hebrew language is built up of either two or three letter roots. <coughs> and here we see that this is a two letter root family cognate. See, we have the, um, the kuf and the resh there. That means that this word mikra had a mim as a prefix added to it and a hey. Now, if you look at these letters, we have the mim, which means it can mean chaos, it can mean water, it can also mean uh, blood. Yahshua shed his blood, right? So that we could have a cool place to escape. Then we see this, the kuf, if you look at the definition of it, it says, it's the sun on the horizon. And in Hebrew, that uh, metaphor means that there's going to be a new beginning. Something is happening. Something new is going to take place. Like the dawning of a new day after the eighth great day. Okay, and then we have the resh, which means the head of a man. So the head of man would bring, what is this? Look at the hay on your little sheet. You'll see that it can mean to reveal. Yahshua is the head who shed the blood. And on that day, a new beginning is going to take place. And he's going to reveal to us the cool place to escape. 
This stuff is, is, is really simple once you get into Binner's works and it, it and you can look at the letters and it tells you the story that you can and then you can look at your English version, whatever version you're reading, and go, that's translated pretty good, because I see that. But sometimes, well, actually a lot of times, you're gonna go, wait a minute. That that doesn't mean the same thing. And and you can just it doesn't mean that the words that we have in English aren't usable. It just means that we can bring a lot more clarity to what he's trying to show us by studying this ancient language. Because he's restoring this to his people. He wants us to know this stuff. We don't need to know it to be redeemed, of course. But if we want to grow, if we want to move up the ladder, instead of just being the guy at the front door greeting everybody, if you want to be over here washing feet, if you want to be over here dishing out the food, if you want to be the cook, you know, there's, there's these levels of places that this language can take you. And I want to be as close to him as I can. And I want all of you to be there. Just as close to him as we can be. Little Jack Wilkes leading the way. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, here we see that the, the two-letter family roots, okay, these are actually, excuse me, that's parents. Once, once you start getting into three-letter roots, that would be uh, family roots. But the parent root is the kuf and the resh. Here we see that word used in a different form. Notice that we have the aleph there, right? This shows us, this, this word in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew means to call or call out, to call a what? Name. Or give a name. How many here just heard a whole bunch of prophecies in your ears? Then the last day he would reveal his name to his people. And at the same time, in his son, Yahshua, he's providing that place of escape by the head of the body. I mean, this, this, this word gathering, that's what it means. It means so much more. Like we were going over, Brother Walter and I were going over earlier, the, the more extensive definition of the word shalom. It means much more than just shalom. It means tranquility to you, your family, the absence of any type of irritation or agitation. It means so much more than just peace. It means may you and your family may always be mentally, physically, and spiritually sound and safe from the adversary. So when, when you go to looking at all these things, you understand how important the, this word was to Yahweh when he told Moshe to relay it to us. There's a reason for him to say to gather. And it's so we can escape that fiery furnace in the end, and we have a cool place to escape. And it's got to do with him revealing his name to us. How many of you guys in here can remember just how you cherished the name of Yahweh or Yahuwah when it first came to your revelation and Yahshua, his son? I remember I felt so much closer to him because my relationship with him, and I've seen others say the same thing, that it became more personal now. And in these gatherings is where you're going to begin to hear. People that come in here using the, the terms G-O-D and L-O-R-D and everything, when they come in here and they begin to hear these things, whenever they begin to hear the names and they understand the feast, what is happening? Yahweh is using us as vessels to bring these people in so that they can escape and come to this cool place that he's provided in his son, Yahshua. Now, that all sounds good, but let's back it up with some scripture in the Brit Hadashah. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 10. Now remember, because most people are under the impression that that stuff was for the Jews, or the, the Yahudim, or for the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to the Brit Hadashah and prove that that is just not so. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. For everyone who calls on the... Wait a minute. That's the same exact thing that he spoke through this one word. Given to us in Torah. For everyone who calls on the name... And many aversions have replaced that with another title. That is dangerous. Dangerous. 
Because this apostle specifically said the one that he believed upon. For everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. And guess what? See that? That's in parentheses. He's teaching out of the Torah. He's teaching out of the prophets. It's a quote out of the Old Testament. And he said it's still relevant to your salvation today. How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? People say I believe in, uh, and we have all kinds of religions in the world today. Allah, churchanity calls on Jesus and, and everything else. But these apostles specifically laid down some names here. Because they were teaching the same exact way of escape <laughs> that they had learned generation after generation after generation. How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? So when you take away this and put something else in there, that's what he's saying. These guys didn't even know about the name. How could they believe on somebody that nobody's told them about? The enemy's pretty crafty. That doesn't take away the deliverance of any soul. But it does put emphasis on the first and second resurrection, either prior to the millennial reign or during it at the end, as we just read, in the second resurrection. And here's what we do. This is, this is one of my biggest goals as a man of Yahweh, especially after I was not a very good member of society for many years of my life. <laughs> I've done a lot of damage to myself and others that I came into contact with. But now that he has shown me favor and called me into the body of Yahshua, this is my will, is to do his will. And these people that have never heard and have not believed on Yahweh. <coughs> and, and how shall they hear without one proclaiming? I want to be one of those. We should be one of those. When you're at work, when you're at the mall, when you're in Costco, when you're in Walmart, and you bump into people, you say, have you ever heard about the name of Yahweh or has anybody ever introduced you to Yahshua? We are supposed to be proclaiming this so we can help them get gathered and come into that cool place of escape. Continuing on, now this is as far back as you can study this. Notice this, you go back to the, the, the uh, parent roots. <coughs> the two-letter root definition of ancient Hebrew lexicon gives this. Remember, this has to do with the sun on the horizon. A new beginning, a new time. It's got to do with the head. It's got to do with the head and the body. During a new age. Here is, uh, whenever you get uh, Bitter's Lexicon, when you see the AC there, that's action root. Then this CO means concrete. And the AB means abstract. Many times in the Strong's and all those other lexicons, that's what you're getting is the abstract definitions. That's what makes this lexicon so much different. It points to concrete meanings. Biblical, Hebrew meanings. Now look here. It means call or a meeting. The pictograph, Kuf, is a picture of the sun at the horizon and the gathering of the light. Does anybody have their scriptures open? Matthew 5.14. It's a call and a meeting. It's what this gathering is all about. Brother Larry? For a city to be hidden on a mountain. We 
are the light of the world. That was spoken by Yahshua, our Redeemer. What does it got to do with it? He told his disciples that believed on him and were immersed and had been following him and he had been teaching. They were gathered to him. And he said, you are the light. Look at the ancient definitions. A call and a meeting, and these letters mean the sun at the horizon and the gathering of the light. And we are the light of the world. The resh is a picture of the head of man. Who is the head of the body? Yahshua. Combined, these mean gather the men and women and children. The meeting or bringing together of people or objects by arrangement. That's why the feasts are arranged in the order that they're in. And we went over this in last night's PowerPoint. You notice when they uh, dedicated the, the temple of Solomon, that it wasn't until tabernacles came along that they actually dedicated the temple to Yahweh. That means in the final year that the temple was being prepared, the sukkah, in the final year, they had to go through Passover, unleavened bread, Shavuot, Pentecost, and they had to go through atonement and trumpets as well before the temple was prepared. That's why we go through these feasts. We're preparing our temple for the dwelling of Yahweh. It's an arrangement put forth by the Father. And this can also mean by accident, but here we have the key word or purchase. And we were purchased by the head of the body. So these, the study of the ancient hieroglyphics, even when you start getting advanced in it, you start studying from the English and Greek in the, in the Brit Shah, back to this, starts to confirm things and show you things that you never saw before in Scripture. It's been the same plan Cover to cover. Hallelujah. All right. So now we want to do what we want to do is uh, do a comparison of the coverings, or excuse me, of the gatherings. So far, we have seen by definition many points in the gathering of Yahweh's people. Where do these people come from in the latter days? That's the question, because that's what we're living in now. Those people, of course, the forefathers, the patriarchs. They lived it already. They lived it throughout. And we see what happened whenever Israel became disobedient. They couldn't stay in the land. Where do these people come from in the latter days? Does Torah ever show us where these people come from? Let us take a deep look at that. At the time of the following verses, we need to pay very close attention to that. At the time of the following verses that we're going to read here, the children had not come into the land of promise yet. They were still in the nations. They were just coming out of Egypt. We haven't entered into the promise yet. But we're gathering and preparing ourselves for it, correct? So were they. Once again, same story, cover to cover. And they came to the mountain to serve Yahweh, just as we see in the following verses of prophecy. The people were scattered. We can look around right now. We've got people from uh, Montana. We've got people from Washington. We've got people that come from all over the place to come to Sukkot. To gather. Now remember, we're being gathered out of the nations, right? We are the nation of Israel. Yahshua is preparing us right now. And we are rehearsing this year after year after year. Until he comes back, we're going to be prepared. We're preparing our temple for the presence and the dwelling of the Almighty. So let's take it to the prophets and confirm this. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 34 to 38. And I shall bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the land where you are scattered. Before they even got to the land, he had already told them you're going to be disobedient and you are not going to be able to stay in the land. But I'm going to regather you out of the wilderness 
out of Egypt, out of Mithraim. With a mighty hand. I'd say his right hand. He who's standing in his right hand right now. And with an outstretched arm. And with wrath poured out. Now remember what we were seeing a minute ago. There's a cool place of rest for one group of people. And there's a burning fire for everything in opposition to Yahweh, correct? And I shall bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and shall enter into judgment with you face to face. Whenever we come into judgment means we come into the knowledge of Torah, we realize what we've been sinning, and we go, forgive us, Father. I need to enter into judgment with you now before that great and awesome day of Yahshua returns and the thousand millennial reign, thousand year millennial reign kicks into high gear and I'm outside the kingdom. See, those who have entered into judgment now and, and confessed in the name of his son and been covered in the blood enter into the kingdom. <coughs> As I entered into judgment with your fathers, the same way he entered into judgment with the patriarchs, in the wilderness of the land of Mitzrayim, so I shall enter into judgment with you. You are not going to get out of this judgment. <laughs> it, it's been happening since the Garden of Eden. And everybody will be judged according to their works, according to what we read in the book of Revelation. There's no getting out of it. Before you enter into that sukkah, you will have to repent, you will have to call on the name of Yahshua and Yahweh, and you will have to submit to the rules of the kingdom. And I shall make you pass under the rod, Remember what happened whenever uh, uh, Yahushua ben Nun was up against the Amalekites and Moses was lifting up the rod. And whenever his arms began to get tired, we were speaking about this yesterday, then he, the rod would lower and the people began to have struggle in the battle. So what they did was is they set the prophet, Moshe, on the rock representing Yahshua the prophet was resting on the rock. And who held up his arm to make sure the rod was suspended? The priests. There's the good news as well. That the rock supports what the prophets were speaking. And the priesthood will uphold the rod that this is speaking about. <laughs> And shall bring you into the bond of what? The covenant. Then we're back in covenant with him. This is all a prelude as to what would happen in the in the uh, Brihad Hashem. In the days of Yahshua, walk the earth. And purge the rebels from among you. What's happening to the disobedient? Where are they going? Into the lake of fire. Going to purge the evil from our midst. And those who transgress against me. Same teaching that we see in 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, and 3, verse 4. It's the same exact teaching. From the land where they sojourn, I bring them out, but they shall not come into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. <coughs> That's talking about the second resurrection at the end of the thousand year millennium. Now, we just seen that during, okay, uh, over the past couple of, uh, well, maybe the last week or so, we've read a lot of verses talking about the gathering of these specific twigs and branches and all these things to make our sukkah with, right? This is the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. The top of it, of course, is charcoal black from the presence of Yahweh. Do you see very many trees on that mountain? Water? Vegetation? This is at the foot of the mountain where it is believed that sacrifices were done. Look at, look at what's growing there. This is a four-story tall rock that they say 
is where the water gushed out and gave enough water to water all of the herds and all the people of Israel. Do you see one tree around this area anywhere? That's very significant. The gathering prophecy. It all takes place once we're in the land. We're not in the land yet. I tried, I built my sukkah the best I could, according to scripture, right? But, you know, instead of palm branches and these, these willows and everything, you know what I got? Cottonwood. <laughs> I got some cottonwood branches. I didn't have everything, that, and I couldn't find the fruit, of course. And, it, and uh, I mean, it's just hard to find everything that he says to build the sukkah with now. Well, we just saw pictures of the place where they were at. And this is where they were given this command. Leviticus 23, 40 through 43. <clears throat> and you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of good trees. Remember the picture we just seen. They're at the mount when this command was given to them. The, the fruit of good trees, branches of palm trees, twigs of leafy trees, and willows of the stream, and shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim for seven days. And you shall observe it as a festival unto Yahweh for seven days in the year. And you all, <laughs> until the Messiah came, huh? forever, in your generations, to all generations, observe it in the seventh month, that's where we're at, dwell in booths, that's our sukkah, for seven days. All who are native Israelites dwell in booths so that your generations know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, which can many times once again represent the world. I am Yahweh your own. Uh, in the defense, real quick, so that your generations know that I made the children of Israel dwell there, and here we see that it was uh, natives. Remember, once again, if you go back further into the Torah, anybody who had been circumcised and partook of the, oh, and his family, anybody who had been circumcised and partook of the Passover lamb was considered a native Israelite. That's who it's talking about here. Even the sojourners. There was natives there that had, were not born in the genealogies of the Hebrew people. Or may have been and didn't know it and later sojourned with them. So, here we see the command to gather all of these specific branches. Fruit of goodly trees. The fruit trees, the branches, the twigs, and willows are, I submit to you, types of people. Remember, many times in prophecies we see... Um, even in the Garden of Eden, if you look at that at the soul level, the trees in the midst, the seed and all of that, it represented two different groups of seed. Now let's go over the fruit first. In the history of Israel, anybody can Google this, uh, what fruit was it talking about uh, in Leviticus, and, and you'll come up with many different commentaries um, written about this history for generations, years ago. It goes back a long ways. And this is the stuff that you'll find. That this prophecy was speaking about something that would happen once they went into the land. And if you read Leviticus chapter 25, it specifically says that after he gives all of these commands to gather certain twigs, branches, and fruit, so on and so forth. The fruit in the history of Israel... The fruit spoken of here is said to be ephron or citron. I couldn't find any of that when I went to build my sukkah. This fruit has a great flavor and smells very good. This is said by many teachers of Torah to represent a group of people that follow the commands of Yahweh and produce good deeds. The flavor... And the smell, the aroma that we produce in our obedience to Yahweh. It's a sweet taste like honey. 
So let's get some scripture to go with that. John 15, 8. In this my Father is esteemed, that you bear much fruit. Some citral. And you shall be my top ones. Remember, he's gathered us in. And he's saying, you're, 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 you're producing that fruit that all of those prophecies were talking about. Hallelujah. <coughs> the next one is the branches of palms. I couldn't find any of those either. Even though my daughter brought back a palm tree from Florida. She wouldn't let me use it. <laughs> the palm produces good fruit. However, it does not put off an aroma. And the research that you can do on that, it says that this represents a group of people that have Torah, but lack the good deeds. And I might add to that, it also might be people who lack the knowledge of Messiah. Let's get some scripture to back that. Remember, because this is just information that you can dig into historically. But if we combine it with scripture to make it fit, then we know that these concepts of the ancient patriarchs and, and some of the even rabbis of, of today's day and age are pretty much in line with this uh, view of all of these branches and fruit and everything. Matthew 19, 21 through 22, Yahshua said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go. Now remember, this is the rich man that said, oh, hey, I've done all that stuff all my life. I've been obedient to the Torah. What else can I do? Really? Oh, you think you can do something to earn that? Well, I'll tell you what. Go sell, go sell everything you own. That's what happens when we think we can do something else other than what is written and expected as, uh, from us as children of Yahweh. That's what will happen. Oh, you think you can do something other than what I've already told you to do in order to enter into the kingdom? He's going to give you a direct order. Go give up everything you got. Everything I blessed you with. If you wish to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor. And you shall have treasures in heaven. Now remember, the palm branches represent a group of people that have Torah but lack the deeds. He was in the land. Torah was being taught. Yahshua says, oh, you think you can do something else? Go sell everything you own. You better know that Yahshua knows the riches of the heart of each and every individual on the face of this planet. Just like the, the poor woman that put in the last might. It was the riches of her heart and her obedience that gained favoritism and honor to come from the king that day. And you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Then come back and follow me. We never see that man come back in Scripture, so he made his choice. And when the young man heard the word, he went away sad, because he had many possessions. And this verse goes on to say, of course, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of an eagle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom reign. Now we get to the twigs of leafy trees. The leafy tree spoken of here is said to be the myrtle tree. You haven't seen any of those there. Some red fir here and there. Some tamarack and some lodgepole, but I couldn't find any of any myrtle trees. This tree has a very good aroma, but it produces no fruit. And this represents a group of people who may perform good deeds now and again, but they do not possess the knowledge of Torah. Remember, this is that, well, I've never done anything bad to anybody. If there is an Elohim, I'm sure he won't have a problem with letting me go in. Even though I don't believe in his word, I've never confessed in his son, and I've never been obedient to one thing that he asked me to do in his Torah, I'll still get to go in. I haven't killed nobody. I haven't really hurt anyone. Let's get some scripture for that. Romans 2, 14. When Gentiles who do not have the Torah... By nature, do what is in the Torah, although not having the Torah, 
They are a Torah unto themselves. <coughs> so whenever we were in the world in Mizraim, we didn't have Torah. When we came out, we became a Torah to ourselves because we received and began to follow the rules of the kingdom reign. And that leads us to the knowledge of Yahshua, the Messiah. And it also leads us to that cool place of rest and protection. Yahshua, went, if we follow him, if, if people can just not see it in the word, just look at his footsteps and follow him. If they say, I follow, I believe in the Messiah and I follow him in his, in his ways, and you see them turning right into Sunday worship, wait a minute, that's not where you went? Follow him to the left and do a Shabbat service. Follow him to the left into a feast site. Just follow his footsteps and you'll make it into the rain. It's that simple. Do what he did. If he was sinless, and sin is a problem and it separates us from the Father, all we've got to do is follow him. Just do what he did and we're in. The wills of the stream. This tree produces no fruit nor aroma. This is those people that say, ah, that's a bunch of hogwash. <laughs> I don't believe a word of it. And I'm in this world to get everything I can before I die and just be happy. That's this type of person. He doesn't produce anything sweet and savory. Or the smell of obedience from that person never hits the nostrils of Yahweh or Yahuwah. Ever. There's scripture for that. Matthew 7, 19 through 20 says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? Cut down and thrown where? Into the fire. It's talking about that lake of fire in the end that we've just seen in prophecy. If we've got one of these things going on in our life that wasn't that first group of definitions that we looked at concerning the smell and the fruit, then we are subject to that fire. This is the words of somebody very, very special in each and every one of our lives. He said that if, you're, if you are a tree, if you are a branch and you're not producing any fruit, that's where you're going. And I'm here to save you from it. I'm here to help you. I'm here to inhabit you. I'm here to place my tent in your tent so that we can be one as me and the Father are one. So then, by their fruits, you shall know them. The summary of the teaching, which means we're going to a close here. What we have learned is that all of the prophecies, along with the Torah itself, pointed toward what will take place leading up to and during the thousand-year reign of Yahshua. We see that even the ancient Hebrew itself shows us the same exact thing, as well as a way out of the lake of fire. We also have learned that many times the trees, fruit, and branches represent people and their way of life. Let us learn from this that we may be able to gather under Yahweh's sukkah in his protection. Hallelujah. So let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this closing night of your appointed times. We thank you so much for your word, your language, your presence in our lives. And we ask that you would lead us into this new season that is coming upon us soon, Father. Begin to help us gather others to be with us, to enter that cool place of rest. Hallelujah. We thank you so much for your word, for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Once again, we thank you so much for the blood that was shed. We ask and pray all of this in the precious name of your Son, Yahshua HaMashiach.
May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh's face shine upon you and show favor to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Like a